said this is the biggest thing ever. Support, e-commerce, uh, data exchange, it's, it's pervasive. Therefore, it's just part of normal business life. Because it really isn't about technology. It's about how you think about people, process, and the tools you're going to use and how you work with your customers. What everybody's going to want is you.com. That is exactly what it is for them. The Internet. While we have traveled so far, we have just begun the journey. The Internet is indeed in its infancy, and like television before it, will change every aspect of life worldwide for generations to come. Television was born in the 1930s, but came into its own in the early 1950s, when over a million households finally had a television. While watching Milton Berle or Sid Caesar's show of shows, no one could imagine what the future would bring. As the costs of all facets of the industry came down, the plethora of choice in both viewing devices as well as channels of programming increased exponentially, and so have the capabilities of the medium. Today, many households have over a thousand channels to choose from. Interactive set-top boxes, VCRs, DVD players and recorders, TiVo and replay units, and plasma televisions. No one could imagine all this in 1953, some 50 years earlier. And that brings us back to the Internet. Because our question of the evening is, where is the Internet going 10, 20, 50 years from now? To see where we are going, let's first take a look at where we have been. You have to remember that there were a lot of prophecies for the Internet without calling it the Internet. Uh, it was called the Information Superhighway. It was called Interactive Television. It was called Set-Top Boxes. It was called Video Servers. Uh, the French called it Minitel. There were a lot of w different ways that people called the Internet, and there were a lot of predictions, a lot of conferences, but very few people actually were able to say, oh, here it is. The promise was the rebirth of Alexandria. That was, the Library of Alexandria was the last time all of the information in the world was in one place. And now it is reassembling vis-a-vis -vis this network. And that is what's exciting about uh, the Internet. By the 1980s, it was already clear that the world of computing, of information technology, had entered a fundamental transformation, an architectural transformation, from the centralized, monolithic, inflexible IBM mainframe data center to progressively more and more networked, distributed computers where local intelligence and local processing empowered people, at that point in time, mostly engineers and scientists, to do useful work and share their results and share data across a network. So what happened was, for a long time, what was gating computing was, was the, the microprocessor and the power of the computer. And all of a sudden, somewhere in the early 90s, we realized it was actually the network that was gating. And, and Sun had a, an idea called the network is the computer. And we began to think, you know, if the network could really be the computer, what would happen? And, all, and then the internet came along and you thought, whoa the network might really become the computer. And you saw, this, you saw this behavior which had been allowed to incubate for actually 20 years before anybody actually knew the internet was the internet, where people were self-organizing around communication styles and patterns that were not predicted. I mean, you used to, and you began to think, well, hang on, how could we begin to leverage that? And there, at about the same time, intellectually, there was this, all this interest in chaos theory and in self-organizing systems and in complexity. And, and people looked at the internet and they said, this is the living example of how, how systems become uh, you know, self-organizing and more complex. And so then the bright boys with the capital start saying, well, hang on, this is going to create all kinds of new communication relationships. We can re-engineer blah, blah, blah. We're going to have universal consumerism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was this phenomenal intellectual rush. And, and, and it really did feel like being in the Renaissance. It felt like you're, you're right in the middle of, you know, all mental currents are converging on this moment. It seemed so obvious to me, and it would 
frankly, annoy me that it didn't seem obvious to other people. You know, you can start shouting when you say, look, all we're talking about is we want every computer to connect to every other computer. What's the big deal? Right? Obviously, if you have a computer, it's more useful if they're connected together. Do you, you have your fax machine. Do you not want to connect it to other fax machines? You're going to have a little island of fax machines that only talk to each other? Why would you do that? So it's important to look at kind of technology as an evolution. And in our industry, always, 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 and I guess if there is one kind of really salient point that I would try to get across, people, and that's consumers, businesses, analysts, always overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in 10 years. And that also is true with the internet. It was true with the personal computer before it. It was true with the mini computer before that. It was true with the mainframe. It's really true with a lot of things that people come along and make these big promises. Oh, the whole world is going to change. Everything's going to change. And then it doesn't change, and then people are wondering why is it not changing. And then people get into a mode of kind of talking about, oh, it'll never change. And then all of a sudden, it has changed. And that is because you have to let the cake bake. And that's true in our industry, that's true in every industry, but it's really true with the internet. In terms of level the playing field, I think the vision here was that any customer would be able to see all offers available to them instantaneously and be able to make the best choice, even if it was from a very small vendor in, off in Peru, uh, that, would, that vendor would prevail against the Walmart of the world sitting in, uh, in next door to the, to the customer. So there was that aspect. There was also the aspect that this was going to eliminate the need for intermediaries. Customers would connect directly to the product and service vendors that they wanted to deal with. So who needed an intermediary? Intermediaries were old fashioned. They were basically just designed to deal with the, the limitations of physical markets. Now you had a virtual market. And so there was this notion, uh, this buzzword of disintermediation that prevailed in the, uh, in the early days of electronic commerce. The internet was viewed as a key enabling platform. You couldn't have uh, the kind of opportunity that e-commerce was presenting without the ability to universally connect vendors with customers. And so without that kind of standard platform, e-commerce was simply not available. The vision behind e-commerce, I think back in the mid-90s, was very much this notion of a frictionless economy, that all information would be available to all people instantaneously, and you'd be able to make the best choice for you at that time and uh, eliminate as much as possible the competitive differentiation among vendors. So this, is, this whole issue of the internet created this unbelievable time compression uh, uh, model where, where everybody kind of saw it in platonic time as if all time was in one moment. And we actually funded it as if, it was, as if it, all time was in one moment so that the, the, everything would immediately skyrocket the next day. And uh, what we learned over the last five years is the internet is, is a, going to be a 20 or 30 year journey because there's just layer after layer after layer of complexity. So if we talk about the promise of, say, uh, inf information everywhere, or the promise that your medical records would be instantly available if you got sick in Los Angeles and you live in New York, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers of protocols, the number of files that have to be realigned, the number of processes that have to be put in place, turns out to be much, much, much more complex than, the, than, than we, you know, we kind of originally sort of visioned. So I can remember I was associated with the Internet Capital Group, which had a wonderful set of visions around we're going to re-engineer marketplaces around digital exchanges, we're going to take all the inefficiencies out of the marketplace, everything will work perfectly. And the, all of those things bubbled. They were all bubble ideas. So they went up and they popped. And, and if I, but if you ask me in 20 years from now, do I think that those ideas will be, or versions of those ideas will be in play, my guess is yes, they will. All entrepreneurs and CEOs are making sure that they're going to ride the second curve. A lot of companies never are able to ride the second curve. A good example is DEC. If we were doing this interview maybe 10 to 12 years ago, Digital Equipment Corporation was the second largest computer company in the world. Uh, they started on the mini computer. Uh, they had the VAX VMS operating system. Their a chief executive was Ken Olson. 
And when the PC emerged and Michael Dell was down in Austin, Texas, and he quit his, quit his uh, college education to start his company, Ken Olson said, a, a personal computer, you know, who would want one of those? You know, why would you want one in your home? Why would you want one in your business? He couldn't see that that would be potentially his second curve. If you go back and you look at what happened in the mid to late 80s to the mid to late 90s, the mainframe computing suppliers were disintermediated. That is, they were put out of business by the PC manufacturers and by the network suppliers. Uh, what was the message? It was a twofold message, okay? The message was this is an order of magnitude lower cost than your mainframe and an order of magnitude ease of use, okay? But the functionality was still there that you needed. And in some cases, you have more functionality. So vendors would come in, like the vendor I worked at, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, other vendors uh, like uh, PeopleSoft, SAP, would come in to a corporation, into a company, and they would say, you don't need your mainframe. You can throw away the previous generation of hardware, throw away your mainframe, throw away your enterprise applications from companies like Cullinet, MSA, McCormick and Dodge. These were the last generation of big enterprise software companies. Today in the Valley, people don't even remember that there were enterprise application companies before PeopleSoft, SAP, Oracle, etc. They don't even remember it. But only 10 years ago, companies did not run on PeopleSoft. PeopleSoft was only one year old. SAP was not a major player in the applications business. Okay? Um, Siebel Systems did not even yet exist. So we have a very short attention span in the Valley. The reason these companies were successful is because they provided value at a level that was much cheaper, much easier to use than the mainframe. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, all of the inertial properties of the, of, of the world met this, this inertial free vision of what it could be. And, and, I th and it, so, so there's a kind of a, uh, a train wreck. I think right now we're seeing a huge technology backlash in executive boardrooms. I mean, you go into a large company today, no executive, uh, with the possible exception of the CIO, wants to hear anything about technology. They've been burnt so badly, spending so much money and getting so little return from that investment that basically their attitude is, if I need it to run the business, fine, you know, I'll do the minimum required to run the business, but don't bother me with technology. But it isn't very rare at all that I go into a company who sells magazines or newspapers or tennis shoes or sells cookies and cakes, and I meet a CIO and he says, let me tell you something. IT is how we differentiate here at XYZ cookie company, you know, XYZ magazine company, XYZ apparel company. That's crazy. Do they really think that their financial systems or their customer management systems are so much better than another provider that that's how they're gonna really differentiate? I don't think so. I think it's gonna get down to your core competency. C.K. Prahalad has said, and you know, a company that focuses on their core competency and outsources everything that is not in that core competency is the company that's going to dominate their market. And over time, that has been true, that the leaders who are really strong in their areas of expertise are the ones who are going to deliver the best product. It's, uh, it, it slowed down the, the, the quote dot-com bubble because it was so over-exuberant. When you really look what's going on, I think in some ways the dream is starting to materialize. It'll take another 10, 20 years for really to pan out. Um, but the bubbles isn't really the story. The story is, is that there's lots of people going online now for doing everything. You know, how many people go to online before they ever go to a car dealer? How many people go online before they ever buy a house? How many people go use email now? I mean, so it's invaded our life everywhere. And the technologies that we're looking for now that are the gaining item in the internet, in, in supply chain, and I would argue also elsewhere, in outsourcing and other places, is 
we don't have good service level agreement control systems and visibility systems. Just the ability for, to, for both sides of a relationship to see the same set of facts and to have the same parameters. And part of that is, is there's a bunch of software that has to get done, and part of it is there's just a bunch of protocol that has to get set. And we're, 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 we're a little bit like coming to the table and we don't know which side of the plate the fork is supposed to go on. It could go on either side, but you gotta kinda have a rule, right? And, 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 and so we're beginning to invent all the protocols and there's some languages of which X, XML is sort of like the, the grandfather of which, which are gonna allow us to publish these protocols and reach agreements with them. But like, you know, any protocol, it just takes, it takes much, much longer to sort out than you, you would think. So standards are essential to moving forward into the next generation of financial services. Because if you want open standards, it makes it, and how you communicate, it makes it much easier to move this messaging and information. And our value is about information movement. It's not about money movement. Anyone can move money. That's a low value enterprise. But moving information to somebody who needs it so they can make a business decision, a lot of value there. The ability to communicate will always remain a function of bandwidth. There is no bandwidth great enough that even within 50 years will enable you to share the complete experience of arguing through a problem with a teacher, of interacting with another human being at the level at which, to be vulgar about it, you can smell each other's sweat. But essentially what web services focuses on is creating standards to help connect applications and information together, removing people from the equation as much as possible so that you get more efficient flow of information and exchange of functionality in applications. Things are changing again. How could that be? Well, there's a paradigm shift. And again, this paradigm is in order of magnitude cheaper than client-server computing and in order of magnitude easier to use. And that is what creates a paradigm shift in our industry. Whenever those two things come together and there's that big of a shift. So now what's happening is these companies are getting disintermediated. They were used to be the ones who got eaten. Now they're, they're being eaten. So they're no longer the eaters. They're the food. And what's happening is, is that companies can realize for the first time, and individuals too, that they can do things much cheaper, much cheaper and much lower cost than ever before, much easier. The power that this isn't about software as a service or web services or any of these kind of uh, buzzwords or we have, to put, we have to name everything in the valley to make it important. Okay, but the only thing that's important to the end user, to the customer, is value. Are they getting more now with this new paradigm than they got with the previous paradigm? And that's what's happening. Behold, these companies who are coming now along and saying, hey, you can run your business at 10% of the price that you could with the previous suppliers. No software to install, no hardware to install, nobody to hire, and we provide you the services right over the network, well, this is a huge shift. It's very symmetrical with when I was working for Oracle and I would go into somebody's office and I would say, you don't have to buy a mainframe. You don't have to, buy all the, you don't have to hire all these COBOL programmers. We've done all the work for you. We have, have packaged applications. We have a relational database. But now we say, you don't need packaged applications, and you don't need a relational database. You just need a service that provides all that to you. That is, you can receive over the network the services you need to run your business, to run your life. We had a whole set of proprietary technologies that got sold into companies, and over time, these islands of automation emerging <clears throat> that were very hard to connect together because they had different proprietary standards that that uh, governed them. And so the, co the complexity of connecting all of this together is a huge obstacle to business. And business depends on easy flows of information. So businesses are wrestling with spending a tremendous amount of money creating connections that because they're customized prior to web services, they were customized,
became very hard to change over time. So one, you spent a lot of money to build those connections, and then, God forbid, you had to change those connections in any way because you would spend an awful lot more money on top of that. It's important to remember that the internet today is just a baby. It's in its earliest stages relative to where it will go into the future. The progress that the internet has made in the last couple of decades will be duplicated or surpassed in the next five or ten years. I think we're crawling. We're not walking yet. That's my view of it. And I really don't know how it's all going to play out at the end. I would look at it as, uh, you know, there's three or four years ago there were going to be all these new internet businesses. And now there's five of them. Right? You know, eBay, Yahoo, Amazon's a couple, right, who made it. You know, it's not easy to create a new business, acquire a whole bunch of customers, right, and then fight against big entrenched companies like a Wells Fargo. But the level of authentication and the things that will happen will allow us to go up to any device and it will know who you are and what you have the ability to access. And that is going to be a, a very significant shift because it will greatly expand the market for all of these different de devices. You could imagine that you could walk up to a device, there'd be some kind of a biometric authentication, that is it, it knows it's you because of the unique way your heart beats or the unique fingerprint on your hand or your, the, the cornea of your eye or whatever it is, it authenticates you, it, 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 it identifies what you are able to then go after on the network. Uh, it tells you how your business is doing. It tells you how your life is doing, what's going on maybe even inside your body itself. And these are, these are, big, these are big shifts. And as you make your way through the day, from your business to your home to out with your friends, et cetera, the network is with you and it is essentially becomes almost your companion. I think you're going to see a next web-like craze over the next five years in the world of broadband entertainment. And there's both broadband entertainment, web-based broadband, where you see video and television-like experiences there. And then you're going to see IPTV that comes out of an outgrowth of the television industry with the cable and satellite companies. And the ad models, the commerce models will be slightly different. Yeah, over time, convergence probably takes its toll. And, and you'll, you'll not know the difference in whether it'll be a home media network and all those kinds of things. Um, there are some infrastructure requirements for supporting the back ends of these things that are different than what we did on the web. The functionality, how you work with people, how you connect into the CRM systems of General Motors. Can an automotive company real time change ad insertion in an on-demand world but do it from Detroit? There are some interesting tie-ins there that we don't understand yet. There are some interesting APIs and data standards we don't understand yet. The whole human genome thing has created a bunch of very exciting biology, but it's also created a huge set of computing challenges. We, the amount of, and the creativity of, of computing that is necessary to actually take advantage of what we're learning about the genome, I mean, we're just at the dawn. So, so if, if, I, if, I, if I was in college right now, I, I would be ma majoring in bio, you know, biological engineering or something along that line. It's, just, it's huge. Um, the second thing is the thing we've been talking about during this entire program, which is the internet at one level has completely spread, but all the process re-engineering and all the software and all the human protocols and all the invention that has to happen, yeah, it's a 20 to 30 year window. We've got just tons and tons of stuff to invent there. Boy, healthcare is a great example of the diseconomies of friction. Everything is uh, atomized and made difficult. You know, just taking, get, getting your medical records from one place to another, having your pharmacist know what other conditions you have when you're filling a particular description. Not your pharmacist, better yet, having a pharmacist in a resort town that you're only visiting for a couple of days know what your other uh, health conditions are. Eliminating that sort of friction, I mean, it's no big deal, right? It's in a computer file somewhere. Uh, it's pretty easy to imagine how the pharmacist who's filling that prescription could know. If you're visiting another specialist, it's pretty easy to imagine how he could look at files that had the CAT scan that you got five years ago as a baseline. Wouldn't that be wonderful if you're getting a new diagnostic test to, from a doctor that you didn't see before? Compare that to the diagnostic, similar diagnostic test you had in a different 
different town years ago. Eliminating that kind of friction would certainly uh, save lives. And again, from an efficiency point of view, it would lower costs. And that also saves lives, because then we could all afford more health care. And the health care could be pushed down into the, into the less well-off in society. You, that the network is your mirror that in the same way you go into your bathroom in the morning and you see yourself, that is what the network will be to you. And that is you.com. And that is a big step forward from where we are today. Looking to the future, we see business services as the next level of integration and offerings leveraging the web in ways we can only begin to dream of. Like those before us, envisioning where television would be in 50 years, all we can do is guess, knowing we are underestimating the vast potential of this new medium. Make it very simple for them to do it in an easy way. So instead of them taking an hour a day, it takes them 10 minutes a day. Time is money in these businesses. A new technological infrastructure for commerce and beyond commerce for social life. You're now starting to see it become more and more of a reality, and especially going forward, the television side gets really exciting because you can now see what we did on the internet apply to things like PBRs, TiVo-like devices, and video on demand. And that gets really exciting. In my lifetime, I think the internet is the fundamental, seminal, technological event of my life. Nothing that is modern today will be modern two or three years from now.